Peace and love, everybody. Peace and love. In the early 1960s, Ringo Starr, well known for his easygoing personality, became a legend as a member of the Beatles. Our career you cannot plan. You know, four guys from a club band in Liverpool, wee, to this. One more question, then I'm off. Gotcha. You know, okay, bye. <laughs> Star, primarily a drummer, also sang and occasionally wrote songs for the group, including With a Little Help from My Friends and Octopus's Garden. Boy, kiss a girl, take a trip around the world. Hey, hey, bop, shoo, bop, 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 shoo, hey, hey, bop, shoo, bop, bop, bop. In part, Starr's playing shaped rock and roll for decades to come, as he kept the beat with his sharp, aggressive style behind the kit. But overall, the emotion was great. We worked hard, and we only wanted to be musicians. We didn't sort of sit around and say, let's be famous. We said, let's be musicians. And, you know, as you all know, unless you're from another planet, the Beatles became very famous. As a result of the goodwill and fortune he earned as a Beatle, he was loved around the world and welcomed wherever he went. What would you do if I sang out a tune? Would you stand up and walk out on me? Even though he was the guy who could sing Yellow Submarine and get blisters on his fingers during Helter Skelter, his success and status didn't protect him from the unseemly, unsetting, and depressing side of life. I wish my friend George could be here to give it to me. And I know he would be proud to see that the important work he started with Ravi at the Concert for Bangladesh in 1971 is still going. Although Starr has had more than his fair share of darkness and bad luck, he's been an honorable person through his contributions to music and charities. I only have one thing to say. Peace and love, everybody. Peace and love. Peace and love. He is, and always will be, one of them. The Beatles all hail from Liverpool one of England's largest cities and home to a large population of workers and middle-class families. John Lennon, Paul McCartney, and George Harrison all grew up in stable, albeit not wealthy, homes. But Ringo Starr was a bit more financially unstable. Starr was born Richard Starkey on July 7, 1940 in Liverpool, England. He was an only child, and while his mother doted on him, his father lost interest in family life when he was young. At the age of four, Starkey's parents divorced, and he never saw his father again. He was supported by his mother, who worked as a cleaning woman, and then as a barmaid. Starkey spent 12 months in a local children's hospital, recovering after undergoing an appendectomy and contracting peritonitis as a child. He spent two years in a sanatorium after being diagnosed with tuberculosis as he was getting back to school with the help of a tutor. I was very ill, um, but you're a kid, you know what I mean? Um, you know, for, I had my seventh birthday in hospital and I had my 14th birthday in hospital. And so, and I'd spent a year each time. So it's been two years in hospital, one with peritonitis, of course, and one with tuberculosis. But, you know, kids are great because, you know, it, I didn't want to just be in hospital and tell you that, but it, then you come out and you start living your life, it sort of fades. Just part, it's just part of my life. Among the ways the staff tried to distract and occupy the patients was to have them form a band. This is where young Starkey discovered percussion, striking the cabinets next to his bed with a wooden mallet. Since then, despite his musical talent with other instruments, he was a drummer. Upon his mother's remarriage in 1953, his new stepfather encouraged him to pursue music. He was too far behind in school by the time he returned from the sanatorium in 1955. 
During this time, he tried several jobs that weren't rewarding, but one of his co-workers introduced him to skiffle music. Now this is a story, no, no, it's not a story about a rock climber. Skiffle was played with household objects rather than musical instruments, which were often too expensive for struggling musicians. And Starkey started collaborating with the band regularly. He got his first real drum kit for Christmas in 1957. Like so many people of his generation, Ringo started out in skiffle bands. The great thing about skiffle bands was is you didn't need much to get the thing going. What skiffle is to our American audience is you take a wash tub base, you take the metal wash tub, you turn it upside down, you just put a, a broom pole on it and you have a string on it and you go boom, boom, boom. And if you take the broom pole and there's the string going down like this and you go like that, it makes the string more taut so you get a higher note. And if you take the broom pole like that and then the, the rope is now uh, more slack, you get a lower tone. So you can actually get a bass going and then you have somebody on the washboard, which sounds exactly like you think. You put the thimbles that your mom uses when she's sewing or if your dad can sew and you go, up and down the, uh, the washboard for a percussive effect, then you do need one melodic instrument, so there has to be somebody with at least a rhythm and guitar. So now you've got a band. It didn't take much. And the point of all that is, if you adhere to the musical laws that just set down, you can make a racket that actually makes some musical sense as opposed to just being a cacophonous racket. Ringo Starr's name was derived from both the rings he wore and his interest in country music. And when he joined an actual band with real instruments, Rory Storm and the Hurricanes, his drum solos were called Star Time. When I was playing at night and working in the factory, and then with Rory Storm and the Hurricanes, and then got a job at Butlins, and said, I'm leaving the factory. I was an apprentice engineer. I'm leaving the factory, and uh, I'm going to be a musician. There was a, a lot of uh, chat from not only here, from my uncles and everybody in the family, oh, you know, are you sure about that, son? And I said, yeah, I'm going to do this. But then, you know, it worked out, so we got lucky. The band's first encounter with the Beatles occurred during a tour in Hamburg. The group composed of John Lennon, Paul McCartney, George Harrison, Sue Sutcliffe, and Pete Best. In October 1960, Starr recorded a track with Lennon, McCartney, and Harrison to support Hurricane singer Lou Walters. I think one of the defining moments of Ringo's early life was his stepdad, Harry Greaves, buying him a drum kit. I still can't quite figure out where he would have gotten the money to buy the drum kit. That is a H-E-double-L -L of a purchase for impoverished Liverpool in the Dingle and back in those days. The answer is why he got it, really. He loved his stepson so very much. They had a real bond there. And he saw what Ringo was, uh, the, the light in his eyes when he did skiffle and played the, the drum with him out in the hospital. So when Ringo got that drum kit, not many people had a drum kit. So he's in great demand as a drummer. The Eddie Clayton skiffle band becomes the Eddie Clayton rock and roll band, which Ringo's a member of. And one reason they're a rock and roll band is they got a drummer. And one reason Ringo became such an adept drummer early on is he's in great demand in Liverpool. So Ringo's getting all this work because he's got a drum kit. Funny enough, if you've got a drum kit and you're getting all this work, it's just like playing more tennis or speaking French more frequently when it's your second language. You get better at tennis, you get better at French. And Ringo became quite the drummer and became in great demand working his way up the ladder to Rory Storm and the Hurricanes, who are pretty much forgotten now other than being a uh, name to check on the Liverpudlian scene of 1959-1963. But they were a bigger band than the Beatles at the time. Ringo even had a drum solo, a spot called Star Time, get the pun? And it was because he was such a great drummer, such an outgoing, warm guy, and he really was a good drummer at that time because he, stepdad bought him the drum kit but he's gigging all the time. Starr replaced Pete Best as a Beatles member in 1962. Best's fans were so enraged about the switch that they gave Starr a black eye after his first show at the Cavern Club in Liverpool. Starr eventually won over the group's followers, and he became a beloved member. He was voted the fifth best drummer of all time by Rolling Stone magazine, but to me, in rock and roll terms, he's probably the, the best drummer of all time. His contributions to Beatles songs were the icing on the cake. 
They would have been a big act without him, but I do not believe, without the key component of Ringo Starr, that they would have been as big as they were for both musical reasons and cultural reasons. In the music world, he faced several obstacles, including George Martin, who was producing the Beatles' first singles and had signed them to EMI. As he still wasn't confident enough in Star, he replaced him with another drummer and assigned him to tambourine and maracas. Initially, Star thought that he would be fired, but things began to gel with the fans as well as the group itself. Very soon, all four were on the same wavelength, and the alchemy began. The fact that there are no injuries spread among the near hysterical crowd. This truly is a social document for our time. Please Please Me made the Beatles a pop sensation in England. Beatlemania intensified with the release of their first album together, Please Please Me, in 1963. The song Boys on the album features Starr on lead vocals for the first time. Is it fun for you? Yeah, of course. I mean, you know, it'd be fun for you, wouldn't it? You know, it's great. As part of their pop invasion of America in 1964, the Beatles crossed the Atlantic Ocean in mop-top haircuts and matching suits. Beatlemania was in full swing when the Beatles appeared on The Ed Sullivan Show for their first U.S. appearance. Their song, I Want to Hold Your Hand, was already at the top of the charts when the taping took place, and they then went on to have a string of hits. Audiences of their live performances were packed with screaming fans, many of whom were heart-struck teenagers. What is it? Do you, do you deliberately try and create this sort of screaming reaction? No, we just, you know, arrive at the theater and can always stay away <laughs> Um, whenever we're doing a show, the police always come and say, don't look out the window, you know, because you excite them. Health issues struck again for Starr in June 1964, when he was hit with pharyngitis and tonsillitis. As a result, Starr was temporarily replaced on the road by Jimmy Nickel. Several weeks later, he returned to the tour, relieved that he hadn't been permanently replaced. One of the reasons Ringo Starr is so important, is he's a different kind of drummer. It's also the reason some people that are musicians or fans don't quite get him. Ringo is left-handed, yet he plays on a drum kit set up for a right-handed fellow. To wit, the snare is here. Uh, had he, for whatever reason, I suppose he was always sitting in with people and there was always the drums that way, so he learned that way. But he's playing a left-handed, he's a left-handed drummer on a right-handed setup kit. So when one does a roll across the kit, Ringo's starting the roll with the wrong hand, his natural hand, because he's left-handed and not right-handed. So immediately when Ringo does a roll, it's a unique roll to him. He's got his own timing, of course, but he's starting with, quote unquote, the wrong hand, not the hand that a drumming instructor would have him start with. Another reason he's considered such a great drummer by people like myself and so many others all over the planet is it was Ringo's idea to get a different drum sound. Most drum sounds are dictated by the way the microphones are put on the drums in the recording studio, and of course, the size of the room. If you have a smaller room, you get a different sound. If you have a big room, you get a big echoing sound. If you have a room with a rug and things on the wall, it tends to muffle and soak up the sound, which can be very desirous if you want to do that. And if you're in a big room with nothing on the floor, like Abbey Road Studio 2, with nothing on the floor, nothing on the walls, when you hit the snare, goes, there's a slight reverberation to it because it's bouncing off all of the walls. It's so Ringo had this great idea in the studio to get a different sound, something that would really cut through. 
Ringo had this great idea, I believe around 66, to get an entirely different drum sound, not predicated on where the microphones were or the size of the room or what was on the walls or if there's a rug on the floor or not. He had this great idea. I'll put a towel, if not a tea towel, I can even put a, a bath towel on the snare. It'll still crack, but there'll be cert, certain mid-range resonance and thump that isn't there without because the towel is on there. I will take the rack toms and the floor tom and loosen the heads. So instead of a boink, it's more of a boom, and da da dum da da dum is deeper and has more resonancy. It's a different sound. A little later on, he even put a towel over some, the toms some of the times. If you listen to A Day in the Life, he's sort of playing drum fills. In other words, Lennon's singing, I read the news today, oh boy. Ringo's not playing. He's playing. Da -da 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 he's playing fills, almost like a lead guitar player, around Lennon's vocal. It's a beautiful, beautiful performance. And the sound of those drums is predicated on, is based upon the fact that he's loosened the skins and he's got, he's got towels on them. So it's, it's a unique drum sound. I've heard other people play drums in a wildly different fashion in the rock and roll world. You know, Keith Moon jumps to mind, uh, Ginger Baker jumps to mind. But I've never heard anyone have the tonality that Ringo Starr had. Um, she said to me, did you start it? And I said, no, they did, nodding to the other boys. Uh, I was the last to join. A Hard Day's Night, released in July 1964, included the Beatles' music in a humorous documentary film. Following the success of this first film, the Beatles released Help as their next film and soundtrack in 1965, and Starr provided the vocals for the track Act Naturally. Starr's comic and acting talents shone through in both projects. Starr married his long-term girlfriend Maureen Cox in the same year. Brian Epstein, the manager of the Beatles, was his best man, and George Harrison was one of his witnesses, as well as his stepfather who had given him his first drum set. It was also that year that the Beatles finally met Bob Dylan, one of their idols. It is said that Starr was the first to smoke pot with Dylan, while the others initially held back. This would change over time. You play to them, as it were. And I, so in music, uh, we started off like that. So all our early songs are sort of, thank you, girl, from me to you, P.S. I love you. And it's all really talking to the fans, trying to get them to buy the records. Lennon and McCartney received widespread acclaim for their songwriting talents. But Starr's contributions were seemingly overlooked. While he was known for his drumming talents, he also assisted in the group's creative process, and he was a key contributor to the group's emotional stability and good humor. Bill Hyatt. You know, the Beatles and Capitol, we go back and... Uh, thank you, darling. For those who didn't hear, she said I look fantastic. Another key reason Ringo's revered as a drummer is Ringo's more, his parts on the drums are more part of the song. In other words, when a guy picks up the guitar, you don't just sort of bang out some chords. That doesn't really add anything. You come up with what musicians call parts. So be it the Beatles or the Bangles, you play little th things on the guitar that enhance the song, that drive it along. Ringo seldom, after the early days, he's seldom just going, He's doing little things to enhance the song and bring it into fruition. Listen to Ticket to Ride. He's going boom, bop, boom, 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 bop, boom, 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 over Harrison's dum, 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 dum. And uh, on Rain, which he considers his greatest drum performance, he comes in and out of the song, you know, Rain. Ringo's out for a while. And then he comes in with that the machine gun snare that Topper Head and the Clash uses, that. It's incredible. Ringo, more than any other rock and roll drummer I can think of, contributes a coherent part to the Beatles songs on the drums that is, to my ears, as a musician, unique to all of rock and roll. He's number one at contributing a proper drum part to a tune.
Unlike previous drummers who remained firmly in the background, Starr was considered an equal member of the Fab Four. In spite of the fact that he was not as accomplished as his bandmates as a songwriter, he also contributed a song to each album, and he was pleased with all of the arrangements. It was his unique drumming style that made the Beatles so iconic, and that would influence future generations of drummers for decades to come. The Beatles ended their tour in 1966, performing their last concert at Candlestick Park in San Francisco in August. Their music was evolving and taking new directions as they continued recording together. With Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, 1967, they created one of Rock's first concept albums, which was intended to be listened to in its entirety. Among other commercial and critical successes, Starr contributed the track Don't Pass Me By to the Beatles' White Album in 1968. Each member of the group began to feel alienated from the others when the recording sessions for the White Album were underway, thinking the other three had a connection he was missing out on. As Starr began to feel increasingly excluded from recording sessions, such as Why Don't We Do It In The Road, which McCartney recorded on his own, he left the band, becoming the first member to do so. Well, we were four boys from Liverpool. That's the memory, and we were very close. And uh, I love those boys. Upon realizing how valuable he was to their efforts, his bandmates sent him telegrams describing him as the best drummer in the world. Ringo returned to the studio to find his drum kit covered in roses, spelling out, Welcome back, Ringo. The band was back together, at least for a while. However, as a result of personal and creative tensions, the group continued to erode. While working on other projects, Starr appeared in Peter Sellers' film, The Magic Christian, 1969. You know, I got married and I had kids. And so, you know, it started to change where, as it went on, I mean, my conclusion was that we, we put all our energies into the Beatles, and then it started dissipating with our family. And, uh, and we wanted to do other things. But when we were the Beatles, even in 69, that was what we did. In January 1969, they performed their last show together on top of the Apple Corps Limited building in London for the concert film, Let It Be. What's all this about that the Beatles are going to do less together in the new year? Um, yeah, we won't be too. The thing is, you see, to do things together, the four of us, it's going to be the old things all over again, you know. You don't so, want to do that. No, we don't want to do, you know, what we've done already. So the thing is, because of the film, you know, we can't get a decent script, or we're still trying for one. If we don't do that, we'll most probably all do something else different, you know, for next year. On your own? Yes, but, I mean, it's, it's not like breaking up. We'll still be coming back together at the end of it. I've said before, and I would say again, that without Ringo Starr, the Beatles would have been famous and successful. No question. However, they wouldn't have been the Beatles. There is a chemistry and a dynamic of the Beatles that is, you can't remove any one of them. The Beatles are one plus one plus one plus one equals eight instead of f four, you know? It's just incredible. You remove Ringo and you have a different dynamic. I watched Pete Best several times on American chat shows, and I could see why the other three felt Pete Best didn't fit in. He's a decent bloke, he's an intelligent guy, nice looking fellow, but he's earnest. And when he's asked a question, 
he thinks for a moment and gives, leans forward at the tilt and gives a certain earnest answer. If you look at Lennon or, or Harrison on the Dick Cavett Show or Lennon on the Mike Douglas Show, Ringo on Parkinson, Michael Parkinson, it, they're asked a question and they're so quick, very Liverpudlian wise guy. You know, the, the, George Harrison said, once you get under the Mersey Tunnel and you're in Liverpool, everybody's a comedian. Boom, you talk to, see those guys in a chat show and they're asked a question and they immediately give an answer. It's warm, it's funny, it, it, it's glib, it brings the listener in. And Pete Best didn't have it. Ringo wasn't just a musician for the Beatles, he was a, a mate for the Beatles. He was a brother for the Beatles. They had three brothers, now they've got four. Paul McCartney announced his departure from the Beatles as the group drew to a close in April 1970. The group ended their career with more than 45 top 40 hits in the United States alone, leaving an incalculable impression on millions of fans everywhere. I'm an only child and I joined this band and I had three brothers and they, uh, you know, they looked out for me and I looked out for them and we all supported each other. And uh, it, it was really beautiful to be part of that. And besides that, we made some great records. Starr embarked on a solo career after the Beatles broke up. A collection of Tin Pan Alley tunes, Sentimental Journey, 1970. Included arrangements by Quincy Jones, Maurice Gibb, Paul Martin, and Paul McCartney. Starr's next effort, Beau Coup of Blues, 1971, focused more on country. I can go as long as I can hold the sticks. That's out. I'm not looking to retire. You know, it doesn't make sense for me. I can still play, I can make records, I can play on other people's records. But I think, you know, if I can't hold the sticks, it may get a bit bumpy. Starr was the only Beatle to continue working with each of the others. He played the drums on albums for Lennon, as well as Yoko Ono and Harrison. And he co-wrote the hit single, It Don't Come Easy, with Harrison for his 1973 self-titled album, Ringo. Another thing that's overlooked about Ringo, besides his, his talent on the drums and so on and so forth, is every rock band to be successful, mega successful, I mean, not just successful in the clubs or you had one or two hit singles in the charts, to be mega successful, every rock band, and I'd say every jazz ensemble that's long standing, a, a bluegrass act, a reggae band, has to have somebody in the band who's liked by everybody else, that's slightly out of the fray, that is a warm person, that's impossible to dislike, that's a diplomat, that can bring the others together with a, come on now, fellas, Ringo's that for the Beatles. It's impossible not to like the guy. I've had some friends, in, in the Bangles in particular, met Ringo, and they said, you in two minutes, he's your friend. He's just so easy to be with. You're, you're oh my God, a Beatle. A couple minutes, he's your friend. Ringo is never bad mouthed during the tetchiness of the breakup. He's never bad mouthed publicly by Lennon. I defy anybody to find an interview where Lennon says something harsh about him. He's never anything harsh about him from McCartney's mouth. I defy anybody to find anything bad that Paul McCartney said about Ringo. And George Harrison, of course, was uber close to Ringo. They were great mates. And I thought one of the, probably the greatest moment of a concert for George when Harrison had died and they had that wonderful Royal Albert Hall concert with McCartney and Eric Clapton and Ringo and Jeff Lynn and all his friends. I think the most wonderful thing was everyone came on stage and before they played their song had a few nice words to say. And Ringo came up to the microphones, said a couple of things, sort of mumbling. Then he looked up and he said, I loved George and he loved me. And I think that sums him up. But he was a really good friend, that's my memory. Besides the musician and the Beatle and the guy who loved racing cars and loved gardens, uh, you know, he was a good friend of mine. Among his best-selling solo records 
Ringo gave Harrison two number one hits in the U.S. His success was attributed to his charisma and a team of talented collaborators. The same personality that made him the glue that held the Beatles together for so long also attracted other artists to him. The formula was sound. Starr was also pursuing other creative endeavors at this time besides recording. He appeared in films like 200 Motels, 1971, That'll Be the Day, 1973, and Son of Dracula, 1974, with musician Harry Nilsson. In 1972, he directed a documentary about the band T-Rex called Born to Boogie. Although he established his own record label and kept recording, Starr admitted that his drinking and drug use kept him from accomplishing much else. Keith Moon, the hard-parting drummer for The Who and Starr, were members of a drinking club called the Hollywood Vampires. We had a lot of fun. There was Keith Moon, Harry, me, Ringo, all living together in the house. And we had some moments, folks, but it got a little near the knuckle. That's when I straightened out in the middle of that album. That's when I realized there's something wrong here. <laughs> you know, this is crazy, man. So then I suddenly was the straight one in the middle of all these mad, mad people. I, su I suddenly was not one of them, you know. Mm. And I pulled myself back and finished off the album best I could, you know. Ringo's Rotogravure was released in 1976, a year after his divorce from Maureen Cox. The album included all of the Beatles songs. Several of the songs were successes. A few more albums followed, but none had much success commercially. He co-starred in the comedy Caveman with Barbara Bach in early 1980, and the two soon fell in love, getting married a year later. John Lennon was fatally shot and killed outside his New York City apartment building in December 1980 by a troubled fan named Mark David Chapman, an event that disturbed millions of fans around the world. Although it certainly upset all those who grew up listening to the Beatles, it was devastating to someone who was in the Beatles with Lennon. Starr told Rolling Stone he was in the Bahamas when he learned of his friend's death. I was getting a phone call from my stepkids in LA saying, something's happened to John. And then they called and said, John's dead. And I didn't know what to do. Starr jumped on a plane to New York and headed to the apartment Lennon shared with his wife, Yoko Ono, and their young son, Sean. For a while, Starr hung out with Sean, offering comfort and support, playing with him and keeping him engaged to distract him from the tragedy. Despite his brave face, Starr was utterly destroyed by the tragedy. With songs produced by Harry Nilsson, McCartney, Harrison, Ronnie Wood, and Stephen Stills, Starr released Stop and Smell the Roses. It was supposed to include two songs that Lennon had offered him, but Starr no longer felt that they were appropriate to record following his former bandmate's death. In 1984, Starr reunited with McCartney for the musical drama, Give My Regards to Broad Street. I played on a couple of his albums. He's played on a couple of mine. We did the Grammys together. So, you know, every time we do it, it's like, oh, look, they're playing together. And we've done it, you know, 15 times, say, to make life easy. And, uh, but he, for me, is just an incredible human being, besides an incredible bass player. You know, he can sing and write songs too, but I asked him to play bass because I love his bass play. It's so melodic. During this decade, he also became the narrator of the kids' TV series, Thomas and Friends, delighting children who probably didn't know he'd been a member of the world's most famous band. Among the other famous voices used on the show were George Carlin and Alec Baldwin. For the spin-off, Shining Time Station, Starr played Mr. Conductor for a season. In the late 1980s, Starr became a band leader, touring with the first version of his all-star band, featuring Joe Walsh from the Eagles, Nils Lofgren and Clarence Clemens from Bruce Springsteen's E Street Band, Rick Danko from the band, and Billy Preston and Dr. John, among others. We have a great uh, list of songs in this band, and, you know, the emotional 
Madness, and then Reggae from Graham. And, you know, we're doing uh, Latin American songs <laughs> with uh, Greg. So it's a mixed bag, and we're having fun, and the audience should have fun. And, uh, you know, I, I promise everyone in the audience they'll know at least one song, <laughs> you know. Throughout the years, Starr has completed numerous tours with various artists under the All-Star Band banner and released several live albums of this ever-evolving collaborative project. Although he continued to produce numerous solo albums, Starr's 1992 album, Time Takes Time, received some of his best reviews in years. He reunited with Cartney and Harrison two years later to recreate some of the Beatles' magic. Lennon's demo for a song called Free as a Bird was used to produce the first new Beatles single since 1970. They also worked together on the Beatles anthology project, giving extensive interviews about their time together for miniseries and CD release. I have great memories of those times. We made great music, you know, so I'm really proud of the music we all made. And now we're on to the next one. The top 10 hit, Free as a Bird, was released in 1995. Also in 1996, Real Love by John Lennon was reworked and became a hit. After appearing on VH1 Storyteller's television series two years later, Starr shared his music and experience as a recording artist, which resulted in an accompanying album. Liverpool 8 was released by Starr in 2008. The Beatles, Rock Band, a new video game that sold over a half million copies in its first month, was being promoted by him at the 2009 E3 conference with Olivia Harrison, George Harrison's widow, Ono, and McCartney. Well, the same as that inspired me all, the other 18, is that, you know, I'm a musician and we made records, and I've kept making records. Um, and now we make them a little differently because I make them at home and the last sort of five or six I've made in my own guest house studio. Um, and I have a lot of fun, you know, and I hang out with really good musicians and good writers, and it, it's a great way to spend a couple of months. As a solo artist, Starr released Why Not, 2010, Ringo, 2012, and Postcards from Paradise, 2015. I'm archiving my stuff. I decided last year that will actually archive what I've got. And as I was doing that, the Grammy Museum in LA wanted to put an exhibit of mine. And uh, so it gave me the impetus to keep going. And then I found all this stuff. And I found a book of negatives. I had no idea. And so it just started building up. Starr showed off his talent for photography in 2013. Among the images he published were never before seen intimate pictures of the Beatles. Starr told The Hollywood Reporter that the photo book would tell the story of his life as a Beatle better than a traditional autobiography. They only want eight years, really. And I did have a life before that and after that. Well, it's emotional, you know. It's, uh, pictures bring back a lot of memories and of the moment, and especially my mom. And as I said on the on the chat there, you know, she did. She remembered every second of my life. And of course, as a teenager, she used to drive me mad because, oh, she'd know everything. Oh, forget it, you've told me that. Now I wish she was here to tell me it all again. A worldwide publishing agreement was signed by Star and BMG in April 2018. BMG got the rights to the drummer's songwriting contributions to the Beatles' songs, such as Octopus's Garden as well as his popular solo tracks such as Photograph and You're 16. Currently the richest drummer in the world, with a net worth estimated at $300 million, he regularly appears on lists of the top 10 drummers, with other artists citing him as an influence. The honor was presented by the Duke of Cambridge and described by Sir Tim Rice as the most overdue knighthood of all time. While eating dinner in Los Angeles with McCartney, who was knighted in 1997, McCartney gave Starr some advice on getting through the ceremony. Keep smiling. 
last week Paul and I had dinner in LA together and we were talking about from Liverpool to, to here. I mean, you know, it's like mad. In 1965, the Beatles received MBEs from Queen Elizabeth II for their contributions to British culture, a move that was met with protest from previous recipients who returned their awards in protest. Starr was the only one in attendance at his knighting, and he admitted that he was a bit shaky on my own. It would have been great if we were all here. I miss John, I miss George. Ringo Starr redefined the role of a drummer in popular music by making the drummer equal to the lead musicians, and thereby changing the entire paradigm of how people saw drummers. I can go as long as I can hold the sticks. That's how I'm not looking to retire. You know, it doesn't make sense for me. I can still play, I can make records, I can play on other people's records, but I think, you know, if I can't hold the sticks, it may get a bit bumpy. His original playing style evolved from adapting his left-handed instincts to the right-handed drum set, letting his left hand lead in weaving a pattern tightly intertwined with the music of other players, as well as adding unusual accents and stops. The Beatles' sound was shaped by Starr's innovative drumming patterns, time signatures, accents, and original musical compositions. I have great memories of those times. We made great music, you know, so I'm really proud of the music we all made. He played an essential role in the formation and remarkable career of the Beatles through his onstage presence, acting skills, as well as his humor and musicianship. Good. You look great. What's happening? What's going on? I mean, UNICEF and children? As you must have heard, I love children, I used to be one. He is, and always will be, one of them. I only have one thing to say, peace and love, everybody. Peace and love. Peace and love. Thank you.